Moby Dick Chapter 31 Queen Mab Next morning Stubb accosted Flask. Such a queer dream, King Post, I never had. You know the old man's ivory leg, while I dreamed he kicked me with it, and when I tried to kick back, upon my soul, my little man, I kicked my leg right off. And then, presto. Ahab seemed a pyramid, and I, like a blazing fool, kept kicking at it. But what was still more curious, Flask, you know how curious all dreams are, through all this rage that I was in, I somehow seemed to be thinking to myself, that after all, it was not much of an insult, that kick from Ahab. Why, thinks I, what's the row? It's not a real leg, only a false leg. And there's a mighty difference between a living thump and a dead thump. That's what makes a blow from the hand, Flask, fifty times more savage to bear than a blow from a cane. The living member that makes the living insult, my little man. And thinks I to myself all the while, mind, while I was stubbing my silly toes against that cursed pyramid, so confoundedly contradictory was it all, all the while, I say, I was thinking to myself, what's his leg now, but a cane, a whalebone cane. Yes, thinks I, it was only a playful cudgeling, in fact, only a whaleboning that he gave me, not a base kick. Besides, thinks I, look at it once, why, the end of it, the foot part, what a small sort of end it is, whereas, if a broad-footed farmer kicked me, there's a devilish broad insult. But this insult is whittled down to a point only. But now comes the greatest joke of the dream, Flask. While I was battering away at the pyramid, a sort of badger-haired old merman, with a hump on his back, takes me by the shoulders and slews me round. What are you about, says he. Slid. Man, but I was frightened. Such a fizz. But, somehow, next moment I was over the fright. What am I about, says I at last. And what business is that of yours, I should like to know, Mr. Humpback? Do you want a kick? By the Lord, Flask, I had no sooner said that, than he turned round his stern to me, bent over, and dragging up a lot of seaweed he had for a clout, what do you think, I saw, why thunder alive, man, his stern was stuck full of marlin spikes, with the points out. Says I, on second thoughts, I guess I won't kick you, old fellow. Why stub, said he, why stub, and kept muttering it all the time, a sort of eating of his own gums like a chimney hag. Seeing he wasn't going to stop saying over his why stub, why stub, I thought I might as well fall to kicking the pyramid again. But I had only just lifted my foot for it, when he roared out, stop that kicking. Hello, says I, what's the matter now, old fellow? Look ye here, says he, let's argue the insult. Captain Ahab kicked ye, didn't he? Yes, he did, says I right here it was. Very good, says he, he used his ivory leg, didn't he? Yes, he did, says I, well then, says he, why stub, what have you to complain of? Didn't he kick with right good will? It wasn't a common pitch pine leg he kicked with, was it? No, you were kicked by a great man, and with a beautiful ivory leg, Stubb. It's an honor, I consider it an honor. Listen, why Stubb? In old England the greatest lords think it great glory to be slapped by a queen, and made garter knights of, but, be your boast, Stubb, that you were kicked by old Ahab, and made a wise man of. Remember what I say, be kicked by him, account his kicks honors, and on no account kick back, for you can't help yourself, why Stubb? Don't you see that pyramid? With that, he all of a sudden seemed somehow, in some queer fashion, to swim off into the air. I snored, rolled over, and there I was in my hammock. Now, what do you think of that dream, Flask? I don't know, it seems a sort of foolish to me, though. Maybe, maybe. But it's made a wise man of me, Flask. Do you see Ahab standing there, sideways looking over the stern? Well, the best thing you can do, Flask, is to let the old man alone, never speak to him, whatever he says. Hello? What's that he shouts? Hark! Masthead, there. Look sharp, all of ye. There are whales hereabouts. If ye see a white one, split your lungs for him. What do you think of that now, Flask? Ain't there a small drop of something queer about that, eh? A white whale, did ye mark that, man? Look ye, there's something special in the wind. Stand by for it, Flask. Ahab has that that's bloody on his mind. But, mum, he comes this way. Chapter 32 Cetology
Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unshored, harborless immensities. Ere that come to pass, ere the Pequod's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan, at the outset it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more special Leviathanic revelations and illusions of all sorts which are to follow. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put before you. Yet is it no easy task. The classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. No branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cetology, says Captain Scoresby, A.D. 1820. It is not my intention, were it in my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Asterisk 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 utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, sperm whale, says Surgeon Beale, A.D. 1839 unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters. Impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea. A field strewn with thorns. All these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. Thus speak of the whale, the great Cuvier, and John Hunter, and Lesson, those lights of zoology and anatomy. Nevertheless, though of real knowledge there be little, yet of books there are a plenty, and so in some small degree, with cetology, or the science of whales. Many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large or in little written of the whale. Run over a few, the authors of the Bible, Aristotle, Pliny, Aldrovandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gessner, Ray, Linnaeus, Rondelicious, Willoughby, Green, Arteddy, Sibold, Brisson, Martin, Lassipede, Bonterre, Damarist, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scoresby, Beale, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin, Olmsted, and the Reverend T. Cheever. But to what ultimate generalizing purpose all these have written, the above cited extracts will show. Of the names in this list of whale authors, only those following Owen ever saw living whales, and but one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaleman. I mean Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale, compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here be it said, that the Greenland whale is an usurper upon the throne of the seas. He is not even by any means the largest of the whales. Yet, owing to the long priority of his claims, and the profound ignorance which, till some seventy years back, invested the then fabulous or utterly unknown sperm whale, and which ignorance to this present day still reigns in all but some few scientific retreats and whale ports, this usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the Leviathanic allusions in the great poets of past days will satisfy you that the Greenland whale, without one rival, was to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has at last come for a new proclamation. This is Charing Cross, hear ye. Good people all, the Greenland whale is deposed, the great sperm whale now re -igneth. There are only two books in being which at all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you, and at the same time, in the remotest degree succeed in the attempt. Those books are Beals and Bennett's, both in their time surgeons to English South Sea whale ships, and both exact and reliable men. The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessarily small, but so far as it goes, it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Now the various species of whales need some sort of popular comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline one for the present, hereafter to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers. As no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete, must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend to a minute anatomical description of the various species, or, in this place at least, to much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systematization of cetology. I am the architect, not the builder. But it is a ponderous task, no ordinary letter sorter in the post office is equal to it. To grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one's hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs, and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. 
What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this Leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well appall me. Will he, the Leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Behold the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans, I have had to do with whales with these visible hands, I am in earnest, and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cetology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact, that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. In his System of Nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, aloives and herring, against Linnaeus's express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows, on account of their warm bilocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, penum entrantum feminam mammis lactantem, and finally, ex legnaturi germaritoque. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin, of Nantucket, both messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you those items. But in brief, they are these, lungs and warm blood, whereas, all other fish are lungless and cold-blooded. Next, how shall we define the whale, by his obvious externals, so as conspicuously to label him for all time to come? To be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. However contracted, that definition is the result of expanded meditation. A walrus spouts much like a whale, but the walrus is not a fish, because he is amphibious. But the last term of the definition is still more cogent, as coupled with the first. Almost anyone must have noticed that all the fish familiar to landsmen have not a flat, but a vertical, or up and down tail. Whereas, among spouting fish the tail, though it may be similarly shaped, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor, on the other hand, link with it any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien, asterisk hence, all the smaller, spouting, and horizontal-tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cetology. Now, then, come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. Asterisk I am aware that down to the present time, the fish-styled lamatins and dugongs, pigfish and sowfish of the coffins of Nantucket, are included by many naturalists among the whales. But as these pigfish are a noisy, contemptible set, mostly lurking in the mouths of rivers, and feeding on wet hay, and especially as they do not spout, I deny their credentials as whales, and have presented them with their passports to quit the kingdom of cetology. First, according to magnitude I divide the whales into three primary books, subdivisible into chapters, and these shall comprehend them all, both small and large. I, the folio whale, 2. The octavo whale, 3. The duodecimo whale. As the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale, of the octavo, the grampus, of the duodecimo, the porpoise. Folios. Among these I here include the following chapters, I. The sperm whale, 2. The right whale, 3. The finback whale, 4. The humpbacked whale, v. The razorback whale, 6. The sulfur bottom whale. Book I, folio, chapter 1, sperm whale, dot, this whale, among the English of old vaguely known as the trumpa whale, and the visitor whale, and the anvil headed whale, is the present cachalot of the French, and the potsfitch of the Germans, and the macrocephalus of the long words. He is, without doubt, the largest inhabitant of the globe, the most formidable of all whales to encounter, the most majestic in aspect, and lastly, by far the most valuable in commerce, he being the only creature from which that valuable substance, spermaceti, is obtained. All his peculiarities will, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with his name that I now have to do. Philologically considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown in his own proper individuality, and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish, in those days spermaceti, it would seem, 
was popularly supposed to be derived from a creature identical with the one then known in England as the Greenland or right whale. It was the idea also that the same spermaceti was that quickening humor of the Greenland whale which the first syllable of the word literally expresses. In those times, also, spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicament. It was only to be had from the druggists as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb. When, as I opine, in the course of time, the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity. And so the appellation must at last have come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really derived. Book I, Folio, Chapter 2. Right Whale, the, in one respect this is the most venerable of the leviathans, being the one first regularly hunted by man. It yields the article commonly known as whalebone or baleen, and the oil specially known as whale oil, an inferior article in commerce. Among the fishermen, he is indiscriminately designated by all the following titles, the whale, the Greenland whale, the black whale, the great whale, the true whale, the right whale. There is a deal of obscurity concerning the identity of the species thus multitudinously baptized. What then is the whale, which I include in the second species of my folios? It is the great mysticetus of the English naturalists, the Greenland whale of the English whalemen, the baleine ordinaire of the French whalemen, the Groland's wallfish of the Swedes. It is the whale which for more than two centuries past has been hunted by the Dutch and English in the Arctic seas, it is the whale which the American fishermen have long pursued in the Indian Ocean, on the Brazil banks, on the Norwest coast, and various other parts of the world, designated by them right whale cruising grounds. Some pretend to see a difference between the Greenland whale of the English and the right whale of the Americans. But they precisely agree in all their grand features, nor has there yet been presented a single determinate fact upon which to ground a radical distinction. It is by endless subdivisions based upon the most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history become so repellingly intricate. The right whale will be elsewhere treated of at some length, with reference to elucidating the sperm whale. Book I, Folio, Chapter 3. Finback, under this head I reckon a monster which, by the various names of Finback, Tallspout, and Long John, has been seen almost in every sea and is commonly the whale whose distant jet is so often described by passengers crossing the Atlantic in the New York packet tracks. In the length he attains, and in his baleen, the Finback resembles the right whale, but is of a less portly girth and a lighter color, approaching to olive. His great lips present a cable like aspect formed by the intertwisting, slanting folds of large wrinkles. His grand distinguishing feature, the fin, from which he derives his name, is often a conspicuous object. This fin is some three or four feet long, growing vertically from the hinder part of the back, of an angular shape, and with a very sharp pointed end. Even if not the slightest other part of the creature be visible, this isolated fin will, at times, be seen plainly projecting from the surface. When the sea is moderately calm and slightly marked with spherical ripples, and this gnomon-like fin stands up and casts shadows upon the wrinkled surface, it may well be supposed that the watery circle surrounding it somewhat resembles a dial, with its style and wavy hour lines graved on it. On that a dial, the shadow often goes back. The fin back is not gregarious. He seems a whale hater, as some men are man haters. Very shy, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters, his straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall misanthropic spear upon a barren plain, gifted with such wondrous power and velocity in swimming, as to defy all present pursuit from man, this leviathan seems the banished and unconquerable cane of his race, bearing for his mark that style upon his back. From having the baleen in his mouth, the finback is sometimes included with the right whale, among a theoretic species denominated whalebone whales, that is, whales with baleen. Of these so-called whalebone whales, there would seem to be several varieties, most of which, however, are little known. Broad-nosed whales and beaked whales, pike-headed whales, bunched whales, underjawed whales and rostrated whales, are the fishermen's names for a few sorts. In connection with this appellative of whalebone whales, it is of great importance to mention that however such a nomenclature may be convenient in facilitating allusions to some kind of whales, yet it is in vain to attempt a clear classification of the leviathan, founded upon either his baleen, or hump, or fin, or teeth. Notwithstanding that those marked parts or features very obviously seem better adapted to afford the basis for a regular system of cetology than any other detached bodily. 
distinctions which the whale, in his kinds, presents. How then? The baleen, hump, backfin, and teeth, these are things whose peculiarities are indiscriminately dispersed among all sorts of whales, without any regard to what may be the nature of their structure in other and more essential particulars. Thus, the sperm whale and the humpbacked whale, each has a hump, but there the similitude ceases. Then, the same humpbacked whale and the Greenland whale, each of these has baleen, but there again the similitude ceases. And it is just the same with the other parts above mentioned. In various sorts of whales, they form such irregular combinations, or, in the case of any one of them detached, such an irregular isolation, as utterly to defy all general methodization formed upon such a basis. On this rock every one of the whale naturalists has split. But it may possibly be conceived that, in the internal parts of the whale, in his anatomy, there, at least, we shall be able to hit the right classification. Nay, what thing, for example, is there in the Greenland whale's anatomy more striking than his baleen? Yet we have seen that by his baleen it is impossible correctly to classify the Greenland whale. And if you descend into the bowels of the various leviathans, why there you will not find distinctions a fiftieth part as available to the systematizer as those external ones already enumerated. What then remains? Nothing but to take hold of the whales bodily, in their entire liberal volume, and boldly sort them that way. And this is the bibliographical system here adopted, and it is the only one that can possibly succeed, for it alone is practicable. To proceed. Book I, Folio, Chapter 4. Humpback, the, this whale is often seen on the northern American coast. He has been frequently captured there, and towed into harbor. He has a great pack on him like a peddler, or you might call him the elephant and castle whale. At any rate, the popular name for him does not sufficiently distinguish him, since the sperm whale also has a hump though a smaller one. His oil is not very valuable. He has baleen. He is the most gamesome and light-hearted of all the whales, making more gay foam and white water generally than any other of them. Book I, Folio, Chapter 5, Razorback, of this whale little is known but his name. I have seen him at a distance off Cape Horn. Of a retiring nature, he eludes both hunters and philosophers. Though no coward, he has never yet shown any part of him but his back, which rises in a long sharp ridge. Let him go. I know little more of him, nor does anybody else. Book I, Folio, Chapter 6. Sulfur Bottom, dot, another retiring gentleman, with a brimstone belly, doubtless got by scraping along the Tartarian tiles in some of his profounder divings. He is seldom seen, at least I have never seen him except in the remoter southern seas, and then always at too great a distance to study his countenance. He is never chased, he would run away with rope walks of line. Prodigies are told of him. Adieu, sulfur bottom. I can say nothing more that is true of ye, nor can the oldest Nantucketer. Thus ends book I, folio, and now begins book two. Octavo. Octavo Z asterisk, these embrace the whales of middling magnitude, among which present may be numbered, I, the grampus, two, the black fish, three, the narwhal, four, the thrasher, v, the killer. Asterisk why this book of whales is not denominated the quarto is very plain. Because, while the whales of this order, though smaller than those of the former order, nevertheless retain a proportionate likeness to them in figure, yet the bookbinder's quarto volume in its dimension form does not preserve the shape of the folio volume, but the octavo volume does. Book 2. Octavo, Chapter 1, Grampus, t though this fish, whose loud sonorous breathing, or rather blowing, has furnished a proverb to landsmen, is so well known a denizen of the deep, yet is he not popularly classed among whales but possessing all the grand distinctive features of the Leviathan, most naturalists have recognized him for one. He is of moderate octavo size, varying from 15 to 25 feet in length, and of corresponding dimensions round the waist. He swims in herds, he is never regularly hunted, though his oil is considerable in quantity, and pretty good for light. By some fishermen his approach is regarded as premonitory of the advance of the great sperm whale. Book 2 Octavo, Chapter 2. Blackfish. I give the popular fishermen's names for all these fish, for generally they are the best. Where any name happens to be vague or inexpressive, I shall say so, and suggest another. I do so now, touching the blackfish, so called, because blackness is the rule among almost all whales. So, call him the hyena whale, if you please. 
His veracity is well known, and from the circumstance that the inner angles of his lips are curved upwards, he carries an everlasting Mephistophelian grin on his face. This whale averages some 16 or 18 feet in length. He is found in almost all latitudes. He has a peculiar way of showing his dorsal hooked fin in swimming, which looks something like a Roman nose. When not more profitably employed, the sperm whale hunters sometimes capture the hyena whale, to keep up the supply of cheap oil for domestic employment as some frugal housekeepers, in the absence of company, and quite alone by themselves, burn unsavory tallow instead of odorous wax. Though their blubber is very thin, some of these whales will yield you upwards of 30 gallons of oil. Book 2. Octavo, Chapter 3. Narwhal, that is, nostril whale. Another instance of a curiously named whale, so named I suppose from his peculiar horn being originally mistaken for a peak nose. The creature is some 16 feet in length, while its horn averages 5 feet, though some exceed 10, and even attain to 15 feet. Strictly speaking, this horn is but a lengthened tusk, growing out from the jaw in a line a little depressed from the horizontal. But it is only found on the sinister side, which has an ill effect, giving its owner something analogous to the aspect of a clumsy left-handed man. What precise purpose this ivory horn or lance answers, it would be hard to say. It does not seem to be used like the blade of the swordfish and billfish, though some sailors tell me that the narwhal employs it for a rake in turning over the bottom of the sea for food. Charlie Coffin said it was used for an ice piercer, for the narwhal, rising to the surface of the polar sea, and finding it sheeted with ice, thrusts his horn up, and so breaks through. But you cannot prove either of these surmises to be correct. My own opinion is, that however this one-sided horn may really be used by the narwhal, however that may be it would certainly be very convenient to him for a folder in reading pamphlets. The narwhal I have heard called the tusked whale, the horn whale, and the unicorn whale. He is certainly a curious example of the unicornism to be found in almost every kingdom of animated nature. From certain cloistered old authors I have gathered that this same sea unicorn's horn was in ancient days regarded as the great antidote against poison, and as such, preparations of it brought immense prices. It was also distilled to a volatile salts for fainting ladies, the same way that the horns of the male deer are manufactured into heart's horn. Originally it was in itself accounted an object of great curiosity. Black Letter tells me that Sir Martin Frobisher on his return from that voyage, when Queen Bess did gallantly wave her jeweled hand to him from a window of Greenwich Palace, as his bold ship sailed down the Thames, when Sir Martin returned from that voyage, Seth Black Letter, on bended knees he presented to Her Highness a prodigious long horn of the narwhal, which for a long period after hung in the castle at Windsor. An Irish author avers that the Earl of Leicester, on bended knees, did likewise present to Her Highness another horn, pertaining to a land beast of the unicorn nature. The narwhal has a very picturesque, leopard-like look, being of a milk-white ground color, dotted with round and oblong spots of black. His oil is very superior, clear and fine, but there is little of it, and he is seldom hunted. He is mostly found in the circumpolar seas. Book 2. Octavo, Chapter 4. Killer, dot, of this whale little is precisely known to the Nantucketer, and nothing at all to the professed naturalist. From what I have seen of him at a distance, I should say that he was about the bigness of a grampus. He is very savage, a sort of Fiji fish. He sometimes takes the great folio whales by the lip, and hangs there like a leech, till the mighty brute is worried to death. The killer is never hunted. I never heard what sort of oil he has. Exception might be taken to the name bestowed upon this whale, on the ground of its indistinctness. For we are all killers, on land and on sea, Bonaparte's and sharks included. Book 2. Octavo, Chapter 5, Thrasher, Dut, This gentleman is famous for his tail, which he uses for a feral in thrashing his foes. He mounts the folio whale's back, and as he swims, he works his passage by flogging him, as some schoolmasters get along in the world by a similar process. Still less is known of the thrasher than of the killer. Both are outlaws, even in the lawless seas. Thus ends Book 2. Octavo, and begins Book 3. Duodecimo. Duodecimos. Dot, these include the smaller whales. I. The Huzza porpoise. 2. The Algerine porpoise. 3. The Mealy-mouthed porpoise. To those who have not chanced specially to study the subject, it may possibly seem strange, 
That fish is not commonly exceeding four or five feet should be marshaled among whales, a word, which, in the popular sense, always conveys an idea of hugeness. But the creatures set down above as duodecimos are infallibly whales, by the terms of my definition of what a whale is i.e. a spouting fish, with a horizontal tail. Book 3. Duodecimo, Chapter 1. Huzza porpoise, d this is the common porpoise found almost all over the globe. The name is of my own bestowal, for there are more than one sort of porpoises, and something must be done to distinguish them. I call him thus, because he always swims in hilarious shoals, which upon the broad sea keep tossing themselves to heaven like caps in a Fourth of July crowd. Their appearance is generally hailed with delight by the mariner. Full of fine spirits, they invariably come from the breezy billows to windward. They are the lads that always live before the wind. They are accounted a lucky omen. If you yourself can withstand three cheers at beholding these vivacious fish, then heaven help ye, the spirit of godly gamesomeness is not in ye. A well-fed, plump huzza porpoise will yield you one good gallon of good oil. But the fine and delicate fluid extracted from his jaws is exceedingly valuable. It is in request among jewelers and watchmakers. Sailors put it on their hones. Porpoise meat is good eating, you know. It may never have occurred to you that a porpoise spouts. Indeed, his spout is so small that it is not very readily discernible. But the next time you have a chance, watch him, and you will then see the great sperm whale himself in miniature. Book 3. Duodecimo, Chapter 2. Algerine Porpoise, dot a pirate. Very savage. He is only found, I think, in the Pacific. He is somewhat larger than the Huzza porpoise, but much of the same general make. Provoke him, and he will buckle to a shark. I have lowered for him many times, but never yet saw him captured. Book 3. Duodecimo, Chapter 3. Mealy-mouthed porpoise, the, the largest kind of porpoise, and only found in the Pacific, so far as it is known. The only English name, by which he has hitherto been designated, is that of the fisher's right whale porpoise, from the circumstance that he is chiefly found in the vicinity of that folio. In shape, he differs in some degree from the huzza porpoise, being of a less rotund and jolly girth, indeed, he is of quite a neat and gentlemanlike figure. He has no fins on his back, most other porpoises have, he has a lovely tail, and sentimental Indian eyes of a hazel hue. But his mealy mouth spoils all. Though his entire back down to his side fins is of a deep sable, yet a boundary line, distinct as the mark in a ship's hull, called the bright waist, that line streaks him from stem to stern, with two separate colors, black above and white below. The white comprises part of his head, and the whole of his mouth, which makes him look as if he had just escaped from a felonious visit to a meal bag. A most mean and mealy aspect. His oil is much like that of the common porpoise. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Beyond the duodecimo, this system does not proceed, inasmuch as the porpoise is the smallest of the whales. Above, you have all the leviathans of note. But there are a rabble of uncertain, fugitive, half fabulous whales, which, as an American whaleman, I know by reputation, but not personally. I shall enumerate them by their forecastle appellations, for possibly such a list may be valuable to future investigators who may complete what I have here but begun. If any of the following whales shall hereafter be caught and marked, then he can readily be incorporated into this system, according to his folio, octavo, or duodecimo magnitude, the bottlenose whale, the junk whale, the pudding-headed whale, the cape whale, the leading whale, the cannon whale, the scrag whale, the coppered whale, the elephant whale, the iceberg whale, the quag whale, the blue whale, etc. From Icelandic, Dutch, and Old English authorities, there might be quoted other lists of uncertain whales, blessed with all manner of uncouth names. But I omit them as altogether obsolete, and can hardly help suspecting them for mere sounds, full of leviathanism, but signifying nothing. Finally, it was stated at the outset, that this system would not be here, and at once, perfected. You cannot but plainly see that I have kept my word. But I now leave my cetological system standing thus unfinished, even as the great cathedral of Cologne was left, with the crane still standing upon the top of the uncompleted tower. For small erections may be finished by their first architects, grand ones, true ones, ever leave the copestone to posterity. God keep me from ever completing anything. This whole book is, but a draft, nay, but the draft of a draft.
Oh, time, strength, cash, and patience. Chapter 33 The Speck Snyder Concerning the officers of the whalecraft, this seems as good a place as any to set down a little domestic peculiarity on shipboard, arising from the existence of the harpooner class of officers, a class unknown of course in any other marine than the whale fleet. The large importance attached to the harpooner's vocation is evinced by the fact that originally in the old Dutch fishery, two centuries and more ago, the command of a whale ship was not wholly lodged in the person now called the captain, but was divided between him and an officer called the specksnyder. Literally, this word means fat cutter, usage, however, in time made it equivalent to chief harpooner. In those days, the captain's authority was restricted to the navigation and general management of the vessel, while over the whale hunting department and all its concerns, the specksnyder, or chief harpooner reigned supreme. In the British Greenland fishery, under the corrupted title of specksioneer, this old Dutch official is still retained, but his former dignity is sadly abridged. At present he ranks simply as senior harpooner, and as such, is but one of the captain's more inferior subalterns. Nevertheless, as upon the good conduct of the harpooners the success of a whaling voyage largely depends, and since in the American fishery he is not only an important officer in the boat, but under certain circumstances, night watches on a whaling ground, the command of the ship's deck is also his, therefore the grand political maxim of the sea demands, that he should nominally live apart from the men before the mast, and be in some way distinguished as their professional superior, though always, by them, familiarly regarded as their social equal. Now, the grand distinction drawn between officer and man at sea, is this, the first lies aft, the last forward. Hence, in whale ships and merchantmen alike, the mates have their quarters with the captain, and so, too, in most of the American whalers, the harpooners are lodged in the after part of the ship. That is to say, they take their meals in the captain's cabin, and sleep in a place indirectly communicating with it. Though the long period of a southern whaling voyage, by far the longest of all voyages now or ever made by man, the peculiar perils of it, and the community of interest prevailing among a company, all of whom, high or low, depend for their profits, not upon fixed wages, but upon their common luck, together with their common vigilance, intrepidity, and hard work. Though all these things do in some cases tend to beget a less rigorous discipline than in merchantmen generally, yet, never mind how. Much like an old Mesopotamian family these whalemen may, in some primitive instances, live together, for all that, the punctilious externals, at least, of the quarterdeck are seldom materially relaxed, and in no instance done away. Indeed, many are the Nantucket ships in which you will see the skipper parading his quarterdeck with an elated grandeur not surpassed in any military navy, nay, extorting almost as much outward homage as if he wore the imperial purple, and not the shabbiest of pilot cloth. And though of all men the moody captain of the Pequod was the least given to that sort of shallowest assumption, and though the only homage he ever exacted, was implicit, instantaneous obedience, though he required no man to remove the shoes from his feet air stepping upon the quarterdeck, and though there were times when, owing to peculiar circumstances connected with events hereafter to be detailed, he addressed them in unusual terms, whether of condescension or in terrorum, or otherwise. Yet even Captain Ahab was by no means unobservant of the paramount forms and usages of the sea. Nor, perhaps, will it fail to be eventually perceived, that behind those forms and usages, as it were, he sometimes masked himself, incidentally making use of them for other and more private ends than they were legitimately intended to subserve. That certain sultanism of his brain, which had otherwise in a good degree remained unmanifested, through those forms that same sultanism became incarnate in an irresistible dictatorship. For be a man's intellectual superiority what it will, it can never assume the practical, available supremacy over other men, without the aid of some sort of external arts and entrenchments, always, in themselves, more or less paltry and base. This it is, that forever keeps God's true princes of the empire from the world's hustings, and leaves the highest honors that this heir can give, to those men who become famous more through their infinite inferiority to the choice hidden handful of the divine inert, than through their undoubted superiority over the dead level of the mass. Such large virtue lurks in these small things when extreme political superstitions invest them, that in some royal instances even to idiot imbecility they have imparted potency. But when, as in the case of Nicholas the Tsar, the ringed crown of geographical empire encircles an imperial brain, then, the plebeian herds crouch abased before the tremendous centralization. Nor, will the tragic dramatist who would depict mortal indomitableness in its fullest sweep and direct swing, ever forget a hint, incidentally so important in his art, as the one now alluded to. 
But Ahab, my captain, still moves before me in all his Nantucket grimness and shagginess, and in this episode touching emperors and kings, I must not conceal that I have only to do with a poor old whale hunter like him, and, therefore, all outward majestical trappings and housings are denied me. Oh, Ahab! What shall be grand in thee, it must needs be plucked it from the skies, and dived for in the deep, and featured in the unbodied air. Chapter 34 The Cabin Table It is noon, and Doughboy, the steward, thrusting his pale loaf of bread face from the cabin scuttle, announces dinner to his lord and master, who, sitting in the lee quarter boat, has just been taking an observation of the sun, and is now mutely reckoning the latitude on the smooth, medallion-shaped tablet, reserved for that daily purpose on the upper part of his ivory leg. From his complete inattention to the tidings, you would think that Moody Ahab had not heard his menial. But presently, catching hold of the mizzen shrouds, he swings himself to the deck, and in an even, unexhilarated voice, saying, Dinner, Mr. Starbuck, disappears into the cabin. When the last echo of his sultan's step has died away, and Starbuck, the first emir, has every reason to suppose that he is seated, then Starbuck rouses from his quietude, takes a few turns along the planks, and, after a grave peep into the binnacle, says, with some touch of pleasantness, dinner, Mr. Stubb, and descends the scuttle. The second emir lounges about the rigging a while, and then slightly shaking the main brace, to see whether it will be all right with that important rope, he likewise takes up the old burden, and with a rapid dinner, Mr. Flask, follows after his predecessors. But the third emir, now seeing himself all alone on the quarterdeck, seems to feel relieved from some curious restraint, for, tipping all sorts of knowing winks in all sorts of directions, and kicking off his shoes, he strikes into a sharp but noiseless squall of a hornpipe right over the Grand Turk's head, and then, by a dexterous slight, pitching his cap up into the mizzentop for a shelf, he goes down rollicking so far at least as he remains visible from the deck, reversing all other processions, by bringing up the rear with music. But ere stepping into the cabin doorway below, he pauses, ships a new face altogether, and, then, independent, hilarious little flask enters King Ahab's presence, in the character of Abjectus, or the slave. It is not the least among the strange things bred by the intense artificialness of sea usages, that while in the open air of the deck some officers will, upon provocation, bear themselves boldly and defyingly enough towards their commander, yet, ten to one, let those very officers the next moment go down to their customary dinner in that same commander's cabin, and straightway they're inoffensive, not to say deprecatory and humble air towards him, as he sits at the head of the table, this is marvelous, sometimes most comical. Wherefore this difference? A problem? Perhaps not. To have been Belshazzar, king of Babylon, and to have been Belshazzar, not haughtily but courteously, therein certainly must have been some touch of mundane grandeur. But he who in the rightly regal and intelligent spirit presides over his own private dinner table of invited guests, that man's unchallenged power and dominion of individual influence for the time, that man's royalty of state transcends Belshazzar's, for Belshazzar was not the greatest. Who has but once dined his friends, has tasted what it is to be Caesar. It is a witchery of social czarship which there is no withstanding. Now, if to this consideration you superadd the official supremacy of a shipmaster, then, by inference, you will derive the cause of that peculiarity of sea life just mentioned. Over his ivory inlaid table, Ahab presided like a mute, main sea lion on the white coral beach, surrounded by his warlike but still deferential cubs. In his own proper turn, each officer waited to be served. They were as little children before Ahab. And yet, in Ahab, there seemed not to lurk the smallest social arrogance. With one mind, their intent eyes all fastened upon the old man's knife, as he carved the chief dish before him. I do not suppose that for the world they would have profaned that moment with the slightest observation, even upon so neutral a topic as the weather. No. And when reaching out his knife and fork, between which the slice of beef was locked, Ahab thereby motioned Starbucks play towards him, the mate received his meat as though receiving alms and cut it tenderly, and a little started if, perchance, the knife grazed against the plate, and chewed it noiselessly, and swallowed it, not without circumspection. For, like the coronation banquet at Frankfurt, where the German emperor profoundly dines with the seven imperial electors, so these cabin meals were somehow solemn meals, eaten in awful silence, and yet at table old Ahab forbade not conversation, only he himself was dumb. What a relief it was to choking stub, when a rat made a sudden racket in the hold below. And poor little Flask, he was the youngest son, and little boy of this weary family party. His were the shin bones of the saline beef, his would have been the drumsticks. 
For Flask to have presumed to help himself, this must have seemed to him tantamount to larceny in the first degree. Had he helped himself at that table, doubtless, never more would he have been able to hold his head up in this honest world, nevertheless, strange to say, Ahab never forbade him. And had Flask helped himself, the chances were Ahab had never so much as noticed it. Least of all, did Flask presume to help himself to butter. Whether he thought the owners of the ship denied it to him, on account of its plotting his clear, sunny complexion, or whether he deemed that, on so long a voyage in such marketless waters, butter was at a premium, and therefore was not for him, a subaltern, however it was, Flask, alas, was a butterless man. Another thing. Flask was the last person down at the dinner, and Flask is the first man up. Consider. For hereby Flask's dinner was badly jammed in point of time. Starbuck and Stubb both had the start of him, and yet they also have the privilege of lounging in the rear. If Stubb even, who is but a peg higher than Flask, happens to have but a small appetite, and soon shows symptoms of concluding his repast, then Flask must bestir himself, he will not get more than three mouthfuls that day, for it is against holy usage for Stubb to precede Flask to the deck. Therefore it was that Flask once admitted in private, that ever since he had arisen to the dignity of an officer, from that moment he had never known what it was to be otherwise than hungry, more or less. For what he ate did not so much relieve his hunger, as keep it immortal in him. Peace and satisfaction, thought Flask, have forever departed from my stomach. I am an officer, but, how I wish I could fish a bit of old-fashioned beef in the forecastle, as I used to when I was before the mast. There's the fruits of promotion now, there's the vanity of glory, there's the insanity of life. Besides, if it were so that any mere sailor of the Pequod had a grudge against Flask in Flask's official capacity, all that sailor had to do, in order to obtain ample vengeance, was to go aft at dinner time and get a peep at Flask through the cabin skylight, sitting silly and dumbfoundered before awful Ahab. Now, Ahab and his three mates formed what may be called the first table in the Pequod's cabin. After their departure, taking place in inverted order to their arrival, the canvas cloth was cleared, or rather was restored to some hurried order by the pallet steward. And then the three harpooners were bidden to the feast, they being its residuary legatees. They made a sort of temporary servants' hall of the high and mighty cabin. In strange contrast to the hardly tolerable constraint and nameless invisible domineerings of the captain's table, was the entire carefree license and ease, the almost frantic democracy of those inferior fellows the harpooners. While their masters, the mates, seemed afraid of the sound of the hinges of their own jaws, the harpooners chewed their food with such a relish that there was a report to it. They dined like lords, they filled their bellies like Indian ships all day loading with spices. Such portentous appetites had Queequeg and Tashtego, that to fill out the vacancies made by the previous repast, often the pale doughboy was fain to bring on a great baron of salt junk, seemingly quarried out of the solid ox. And if he were not lively about it, if he did not go with a nimble hopskip and jump, then Tashtego had an ungentlemanly way of accelerating him by darting a fork at his back, harpoon-wise. And once Degu, seized with a sudden humor, assisted Doughboy's memory by snatching him up bodily, and thrusting his head into a great empty wooden trencher, while Tashtego, knife in hand, began laying out the circle preliminary to scalping him. He was naturally a very nervous, shuddering sort of little fellow, this bread-faced steward, the progeny of a bankrupt baker and a hospital nurse. And what with the standing spectacle of the black terrific Ahab, and the periodical tumultuous visitations of these three savages, Doughboy's whole life was one continual lip quiver. Commonly, after seeing the harpooners furnished with all things they demanded, he would escape from their clutches into his little pantry adjoining, and fearfully peep out at them through the blinds of its door, till all was over. It was a sight to see Queequeg seated over against Tashtego, opposing his filed teeth to the Indians, crosswise to them, Degu seated on the floor, for a bench would have brought his hearse-plumed head to the low car lines, at every motion of his colossal limbs, making the low cabin framework to shake, as when an African elephant goes passenger in a ship. But for all this, the great Negro was wonderfully abstemious, not to say dainty. It seemed hardly possible that by such comparatively small mouthfuls he could keep up the vitality diffused through so broad, baronial, and superb a person. But, doubtless, this noble savage fed strong and drank deep of the abounding element of air, and through his dilated nostrils snuffed in the sublime life of the worlds. Not by beef or by bread, are giants made or nourished. But Queequeg, he had a mortal, 
barbaric smack of the lip and eating an ugly sound enough, so much so, that the trembling doughboy almost looked to see whether any marks of teeth lurked in his own lean arms. And when he would hear Tashtego singing out for him to produce himself, that his bones might be picked, the simple-witted steward all but shattered the crockery hanging round him in the pantry, by his sudden fits of the palsy. Nor did the whetstone which the harpooners carried in their pockets, for their lances and other weapons, and with which whetstones, at dinner, they would ostentatiously sharpen their knives, that grating sound did not at all tend to tranquilize poor Doughboy. How could he forget that in his island days, Queequeg, for one, must certainly have been guilty of some murderous, convivial indiscretions? Alas! Doughboy! Hard fares the white waiter who waits upon cannibals. Not a napkin should he carry on his arm, but a buckler. In good time, though, to his great delight, the three salty warriors would rise and depart, to his credulous, fable-mongering ears, all their martial bones jingling in them at every step, like Moorish cinders. In scabbards. But, though these barbarians dined in the cabin, and nominally lived there, still, being anything but sedentary in their habits, they were scarcely ever in it except at mealtimes, and just before sleeping time, when they passed through it to their own peculiar quarters. In this one matter, Ahab seemed no exception to most American whale captains, who, as a set, rather inclined to the opinion that by rights the ship's cabin belongs to them, and that it is by courtesy alone that anybody else is, at any time, permitted there. So that, in real truth, the mates and harpooners of the Pequod might more properly be said to have lived out of the cabin than in it. For when they did enter it, it was something as a street door enters a house, turning inwards for a moment, only to be turned out the next, and, as a permanent thing, residing in the open air. Nor did they lose much hereby, in the cabin was no companionship, socially, Ahab was inaccessible. Though nominally included in the census of Christendom, he was still an alien to it. He lived in the world, as the last of the grizzly bears lived in settled Missouri. And as when spring and summer had departed, that wild lobin of the woods, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, lived out the winter there, sucking his own paws, so, in his inclement, howling old age, Ahab's soul, shot up in the cave trunk of his body, there fed upon the sullen paws of its gloom. Chapter 35 The Mast Head It was during the more pleasant weather, that in due rotation with the other seamen my first masthead came round. In most American whalemen the mastheads are manned almost simultaneously with the vessels leaving her port, even though she may have 15,000 miles, and more, to sail ere reaching her proper cruising ground. And if, after a three, four, or five years' voyage she is drawing nigh home with anything empty in her, say, an empty vial even then, her mastheads are kept manned to the last, and not till her skysail poles sail in among the spires of the port, does she altogether relinquish the hope of capturing one whale more. Now, as the business of standing mastheads, ashore or afloat, is a very ancient and interesting one, let us in some measure expatiate here. I take it, that the earliest standers of mastheads were the old Egyptians, because, in all my researches, I find none prior to them. For though their progenitors, the builders of Babel, must doubtless, by their tower, have intended to rear the loftiest masthead in all Asia, or Africa either, yet, ere the final truck was put to it, as that great stone mast of theirs may be said to have gone by the board, in the dread gale of God's wrath, therefore, we cannot give these Babel builders priority over the Egyptians. And that the Egyptians were a nation of masthead standers, is an assertion based upon the general belief among archaeologists, that the first pyramids were founded for astronomical purposes, a theory singularly supported by the peculiar stair-like formation of all four sides of those edifices, whereby, with prodigious long upliftings of their legs, those old astronomers were wont to mount to the apex, and sing out for new stars, even as the lookouts of a modern ship sing out for a sail, or a well just bearing in sight. In St. Stylites, the famous Christian hermit of old times, who built him a lofty stone pillar in the desert and spent the whole latter portion of his life on its summit, hoisting his food from the ground with a tackle, in him we have a remarkable instance of a dauntless stander of mastheads, who was not to be driven from his place by fogs or frosts, rain, hail, or sleet, but valiantly facing everything out to the last, literally died at his post. Of modern standers of mastheads we have, but a lifeless set, near stone, iron, and bronze men, who, though well capable of facing out a stiff gale, are still entirely incompetent to the business of singing out upon discovering any strange sight. There is Napoleon, who, upon the top of the column of Vendôme, stands with arms folded, some one hundred and fifty feet in the air, careless, now, who rules the decks below, whether Louis Philippe, Louis Blanc, or Louis the Devil. 
Great Washington, too, stands high aloft on his towering mainmast in Baltimore, and like one of Hercules' pillars, his column marks that point of human grandeur beyond which few mortals will go. Admiral Nelson, also, on a capstan of gun metal, stands his masthead in Trafalgar Square, and ever when most obscured by that London smoke, token is yet given that a hidden hero is there, for where there is smoke, must be fire. But neither Great Washington, nor Napoleon, nor Nelson, will answer a single hail from below, however madly invoked to befriend by their counsels the distracted decks upon which they gaze, however it may be surmised, that their spirits penetrate through the thick haze of the future, and descry what shoals and what rocks must be shunned. It may seem unwarrantable to couple in any respect the masthead standards of the land with those of the sea, but that in truth it is not so, is plainly evinced by an item for which Obed Macy, the sole historian of Nantucket, stands accountable. The worthy Obed tells us, that in the early times of the whale fishery, airships were regularly launched in pursuit of the game, the people of that island erected lofty spars along the seacoast, to which the lookouts ascended by means of nailed cleats, something as fowls go upstairs in a henhouse. A few years ago this same plan was adopted by the Bay Whalemen of New Zealand, who, upon descrying the game, gave notice to the ready man boats nigh the beach. But this custom has now become obsolete, turn we then to the one proper masthead, that of a whaleship at sea. The three mastheads are kept manned from sunrise to sunset, the seamen taking their regular turns, as at the helm, and relieving each other every two hours. In the serene weather of the tropics it is exceedingly pleasant the masthead, nay, to a dreamy meditative man it is delightful. There you stand, a hundred feet above the silent decks, striding along the deep, as if the masts were gigantic stilts, while beneath you and between your legs, as it were, swim the hugest monsters of the sea, even as ships once sailed between the boots of the famous colossus at Old Rhodes. There you stand, lost in the infinite series of the sea, with nothing ruffled but the waves. The tranced ship indolently rolls, the drowsy trade winds blow, everything resolves you into languor. For the most part, in this tropic whaling life, a sublime uneventfulness invests you, you hear no news, read no gazettes, extras with startling accounts of commonplaces never delude you into unnecessary excitements, you hear of no domestic afflictions, bankrupt securities, fall of stocks, are never troubled with the thought of what you shall have for dinner, for all your meals for three years end. More are snugly stowed in casks, and your bill of fare is immutable. In one of those southern whalesmen, on a long three or four years voyage, as often happens, the sum of the various hours you spend at the masthead would amount to several entire months. And it is much to be deplored that the place to which you devote so considerable a portion of the whole term of your natural life, should be so sadly destitute of anything approaching to a cozy inhabitiveness, or adapted to breed a comfortable localness of feeling such as pertains to a bed, a hammock, a hearse, a sentry box, a pulpit, a coach, or any other of those small and snug contrivances in which men temporarily isolate themselves. Your most usual point of perch is the head of the tea gallant mast, where you stand upon two thin parallel sticks, almost peculiar to whalemen, called the tea gallant cross trees. Here, tossed about by the sea, the beginner feels about as cozy as he would standing on a bull's horns. To be sure, in cold weather you may carry your house aloft with you, in the shape of a watch coat, but properly speaking the thickest watch coat is no more of a house than the unclad body, for as the soul is glued inside of its fleshy tabernacle, and cannot freely move about in it, nor even move out of it, without running great risk of perishing, like an ignorant pilgrim crossing the snowy Alps in winter, so a watch coat is not so much of a house as it is a mere envelope, or additional skin. Encasing you. You cannot put a shelf or chest of drawers in your body and no more can you make a convenient closet of your watch coat. Concerning all this, it is much to be deplored that the mastheads of a southern whale ship are unprovided with those enviable little tents or pulpits, called crow's nests, in which the lookouts of a Greenland whaler are protected from the inclement weather of the frozen seas. In the fireside narrative of Captain Sleet, entitled A Voyage Among the Icebergs, in quest of the Greenland whale, and incidentally for the rediscovery of the lost Icelandic colonies of Old Greenland, in this admirable volume, all standards of mastheads are furnished with a charmingly circumstantial account of the then recently invented crow's nest of the glacier, which was the name of Captain Sleet's good craft. He called it the Sleet's Crow's Nest, in honor of himself, he being the original inventor and patentee, and free from all ridiculous false delicacy, and holding that if we call our own children after our own names, we fathers being the original inventors and patentees, so likewise should we denominate after ourselves any other apparatus we may beget. In shape, the sleet's crow's nest is something like a large tierce or pipe, it is open above, however, where it is furnished with a movable side screen to keep to windward of your head in a hard gale. 
Being fixed on the summit of the mast, you ascend into it through a little trap hatch in the bottom. On the after side, or side next the stern of the ship, is a comfortable seat, with a locker underneath for umbrellas, comforters, and coats. In front is a leather rack, in which to keep your speaking trumpet, pipe, telescope, and other nautical conveniences. When Captain Sleet in person stood his masthead in this crow's nest of his, he tells us that he always had a rifle with him, also fixed in the rack, together with a powder flask and shot, for the purpose of popping off the stray narwhals or vagrant sea unicorns infesting those waters, for you cannot successfully shoot at them from the deck owing to the resistance of the water. But to shoot down upon them is a very different thing. Now, it was plainly a labor of love for Captain Sleep to describe, as he does, all the little detailed conveniences of this crow's nest, but though he so enlarges upon many of these, and though he treats us to a very scientific account of his experiments in this crow's nest, with a small compass he kept there for the purpose of counteracting the errors resulting from what is called the local attraction of all binnacle magnets, an error ascribable to the horizontal vicinity of the iron in the ship's planks, and in the glacier's case, perhaps, to there having been so many broken-down blacksmiths among her crew, I say, that though the captain is very discreet and scientific here, yet, for all his learned binnacle deviations, azimuth compass observations, and approximate errors, he knows very well, Captain Sleet, that he was not so much immersed in those profound magnetic meditations, as to fail being attracted occasionally towards that well-replenished little case bottle, so nicely tucked in on one side of his crow's nest, within easy reach of his hand. Though, upon the whole, I greatly admire and even love the brave, the honest, and learned captain, yet I take it very ill of him that he should so utterly ignore that case bottle, seeing what a faithful friend and comforter it must have been, while with mitten fingers and hooded head he was studying the mathematics aloft there in that bird's nest within three or four perches of the pole. But if we southern whalefishers are not so snugly housed aloft as Captain Sleet and his Greenland men were, yet that disadvantage is greatly counterbalanced by the widely contrasting serenity of those seductive seas in which we south fishers mostly float. For one, I used to lounge up the rigging very leisurely, resting in the top to have a chat with Queequeg, or anyone else off duty whom I might find there, then ascending a little way further, and throwing a lazy leg over the topsail yard, take a preliminary view of the watery pastures, and so at last mount to my ultimate destination. Let me make a clean breast of it here, and frankly admit that I kept, but sorry guard. With the problem of the universe revolving in me, how could I being left completely to myself at such a thought-engendering altitude, how could I but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale ships' standing orders, keep your weather eye open, and sing out every time? And let me in this place movingly admonish you, ye shipowners of Nantucket. Beware of enlisting in your vigilant fisheries any lad with lean brow and hollow eye, given to unseasonable meditativeness, and who offers to ship with the Faden instead of Bowditch in his head. Beware of such an one, I say, your whales must be seen before they can be killed, and this sunken-eyed young Platonist will tow you ten wakes round the world, and never make you one pint of sperm the richer. Nor are these monitions at all unneeded. For nowadays, the whale fishery furnishes an asylum for many romantic, melancholy, and absent-minded young men, disgusted with the carking cares of earth, and seeking sentiment in tar and blubber. Child Harold not unfrequently perches himself upon the masthead of some luckless disappointed whale ship, and in moody phrase ejaculates. Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean, roll. Ten thousand blubber hunters sweep over thee in vain. Very often do the captains of such ships take those absent-minded young philosophers to task, upbraiding them with not feeling sufficient interest in the voyage, half hinting that they are so hopelessly lost to all honorable ambition, as that in their secret souls they would rather not see whales than otherwise. But all in vain, those young Platonists have a notion that their vision is imperfect, they are short-sighted, what use, then, to strain the visual nerve? They have left their opera glasses at home. Why, thou monkey, said a harpooner to one of these lads, we've been cruising now hard upon three years, and thou hast not raised a whale yet. Whales are scarce as hen's teeth whenever thou art up here. Perhaps they were, or perhaps there might have been shoals of them in the far horizon, but lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie is this absent-minded youth by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts, that at last he loses his identity, takes the mystic ocean at his feet for the visible image of that deep, blue, bottomless soul, pervading mankind and nature, and every strange, half-seen, gliding, beautiful thing that eludes him, every dimly discovered. Uprising fin of some undiscernible form, seems to him the embodiment of those elusive thoughts that only people the soul by continually flitting through it. 
In this enchanted mood, thy spirit ebbs away to whence it came, becomes diffused through time and space, like Cranmer's sprinkled pantheistic ashes, forming at last a part of every shore the round globe over. There is no life in thee, now, except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship, by her, borrowed from the sea, by the sea, from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this dream is on ye, move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back in horror. Over discarsion vortices you hover. And perhaps, at midday, in the fairest weather, with one half-throttled shriek you drop through the transparent air into the summer sea, no more to rise forever. Heed it well, ye pantheists.